Lisette, I think we're ready to go. Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. My name is Lisette Robleto de Howarth from the Law Society of England and Wales, and I would like to welcome you to the first Lawyers Across the Globe and Around the Clock for the Rule of Law. For this event, the Human Rights Committee of the International Association of Young Lawyers, the Institute for the Rule of Law of the International Union of Lawyers, and the American Bar Association Section of International Law joined forces with other bars, associations, and law societies from around the world to launch the first 24-hour webathon on the rule of law. A universal commitment of the world's lawyers to the rule of law has inspired us and many others to join forces and launch this first of its kind webathon. We are proud to be part of it. With the world now facing unprecedented challenges, lawyers remain the first line, line of defense against efforts to undermine, restrict, or overthrow the rule of law. To highlight the critical importance of that mission and the unwavering commitment shared by many lawyers globally, we have chosen to come together to continue raising awareness about the rule of law and its significance to the world today. This 24-hour rule of law webathon will consist of a series of two-hour panel discussions across the globe, spanning continents and time zones. The rule of law webathon will roll from today, 4th of May, at 2 o'clock GMT or 3 o'clock UK time, and will end at 2 o'clock GMT on the 5th of May. There are 12 panels hosted by a leading bar or law society, and each panel will address a different aspect of the rule of law on topics as varied as gender equality and the rule of law, the challenges of fragile system in the Americas, racial discrimination, the persecution of lawyers and the role of international bars, the role of lawyers in protecting the rule of law, access to justice for refugees during COVID and justice amid military conflict, among other relevant themes. For the full list and times, please explore more this YouTube channel. In the case of the UK, I am delighted and I'm very proud that the Law Society of England and Wales will be kicking off these discussions with this rule of law colloquium entitled, why is the rule of law relevant today and what we can do to protect it? We have a stellar set of speakers, starting with our very own Law Society President, I, Stephanie Boyce. Stephanie is the 177th, the sixth female, the first black office holder, the first person of color, and the second in-house solicitor in almost 50 years to become president of the Law Society of England and Wales. Stephanie was admitted as a solicitor in 2002. She is a council member of the Law Society representing the Women's Lawyers Division former chair of the Strategic Litigation Group and a member of the board of the Law Society. She has recently been appointed to Her Majesty's Treasury and the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy Independent Task Force to boost socioeconomic diversity at senior levels in the UK's financial and professional services. In 2020, Stephanie was voted to the Governance Hot 100 Board Influencer and made the power list 100 most influential black people in the UK in 2021. Handing over to you, Stephanie. Thank you very much, Lisette, for that introduction. I would like to start by welcoming you all to what I am sure will be a fascinating 24 hours of debate and discussion on the rule of law. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the UIA, ABA SIL, AIJA, HRRC, and all the other organizations that have helped make this event possible. The rule of law provides the fulcrum for social contracts. It is the fabric of societies that guarantees human rights, economic opportunity and development and fundamental freedoms recognized as self-evident. Lawyers take oaths to defend the rule of law they are the first line of defence against efforts to undermine, circumscribe or diminish the rule of law. The universal commitment 
of the world's lawyers to the rule of law motivates and energizes this project. When viewed from a global perspective, it is clear that the rule of law is both essential to resolve in many of the biggest challenges we face and under threat from illiberal forces and the adverse effects of the pandemic. One area which the rule of law has the potential to improve the lives of billions of people is in the fight against rising inequality. Last year, the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs published the World Social Report 2020. And the report found that inequality is growing for more than 70% of the global population, exacerbating the risk of divisions, slowing economic growth and hampering social development. However, the rise of inequality is far from inevitable. Last year, the European Economic and Social Committee issued an opinion on the rule of law and its impact on economic growth. It stated that sustainable economic growth is one of the most important indicators of the health of an economy and is associated with the increased wealth of a country and its citizens. Market economies of this kind cannot exist without stable and predictable rules and procedures, including rules regarding private ownership and the voluntary transfer of ownership. The instability brought about by a lack of stable rules and procedures will also cause a nation to struggle to attract vital long-term investment. Therefore, a robust, independent, open, accessible, and reliable justice system and legal profession are vital to a country's ability to achieve long-term sustainable economic growth and thus tackle rising inequality. The rule of law also has a key role to play in combating climate change. As legal principles and rules provide the framework through which we can direct human behavior towards a way of life that is more environmentally sustainable. In its 2020 World Economic Situation Report, the UN warned that the climate crisis is affecting the quality of life in many societies and fueling discontent. The report is unequivocal in its call for massive adjustments to the energy sector, which is currently responsible for around three quarters of global greenhouse gas emissions. The report's authors insist that the world's energy needs must be met by renewable or low carbon energy sources, which lead to environmental and health benefits, such as lower air pollution and new economic opportunities for many countries. However, this urgent need to switch to clean energy continues to be underestimated, with countries continuing to invest in oil and gas exploration and coal-fired power generation. Without robust, legally binding international treaties on climate change, such as the Paris Agreement, it is likely that the switch to clean energy will come too late to save our planet. No country is exempt from the risk of abuses of power and constraints to civil liberties. There is a danger that under the guise of the pandemic, which has legitimized rapid decision-making and reduced government scrutiny, many countries have become more exposed and vulnerable to the erosion of the rule of law. For this reason, it is essential that the rule of law is safeguarded and access to legal advice and justice is maintained during emergency situations to enable those most at risk to challenge these effects and enforce their rights. The 2020 Rule of Law Index recorded an overall deterioration and stagnation across eight key categories, which has been the trend for the past three years, indicating a persistent decline in the rule of law globally even prior to the pandemic. 
the index found that fundamental rights, constraints on government powers and absence of corruption are among the most pronounced categories of decline globally. The targeting of lawyers for representing their clients through intimidation, imprisonment, direct threats and harassment seems to have become a pattern that prevents lawyers from exercising their professional duties. This directly impacts on access to justice and erodes the rule of law. And the Law Society has been monitoring attacks on lawyers and human rights defenders for many years. In 2017, we launched the first intervention tracker, which aims to monitor attacks and identify global and regional trends. In 2020, the highest percentage of incidents concerned arrest or detention, harassment or threats, and threats to the rule of law and judicial independence. Compared to previous years, 2020 saw a significant increase in incidents in the European region, especially Turkey and Poland. During the pandemic, there has been a general concern for imprisoned lawyers and human rights defenders, given the lack of appropriate prison conditions, which has now worsened as a result of the pandemic. When a nation experiences the breakdown of the rule of law, the consequences are often severe and far reaching. As economic growth becomes more difficult to sustain, development often comes to a halt, encouraging increased social tension and the potential escalation of internal conflict. If violent crime is not prosecuted, human security is put at risk. And without enforceable property rights, foreign investment dries up. As a result, individuals are forced to live in societies without access to justice, jobs, health, or education. Therefore, establishing and maintaining the rule of law is a fundamental imperative in promoting social and economic development. Lawyers are perfectly positioned to play a vital role in upholding the rule of law and human rights, in helping to establish and maintain democracies, and in building a prosperous economies due to their skills and position in society. The access to justice of all citizens to hold governments and other actors to account depends on the independence of the legal profession, which is fundamental to every democracy. And that is why in jurisdictions where lawyers are unable to carry out their legitimate professional duties for fear of arrest, detention or intimidation, they cannot properly uphold the rule of law or effectively represent persons facing inappropriate or politically motivated criminal proceedings. The topics I have touched upon only scratch the surface of the myriad of ways in which the rule of law is shaping and is being shaped by the modern world. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing all of the insight of today's speakers. I will now hand over to our moderator for today, Christoph Sikin. Christoph is Assistant General Counsel at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, responsible for managing the in-house legal support of EBRD's investment operations. He is also the current chair of the International Committee of the Law Society of England and Wales, a member of the Executive Committee of the Association of Lawyers in Intergovernmental Finance and Development Organisations, and Editor-in-Chief of the Intergovernmental Organisations In-House Council Journal, Alifto's Law Journal. Thank you, Christoph. Thank you very much, Stephanie and, and Lisette, um, for this introduction also to me. Indeed, it is, it is a real, real big honor for our law society here in England and Wales to have been asked to kick off what promises to be an exciting series of webinars on a topic that is of the utmost importance, not just to lawyers, but to society at large. 
Our audience today are lawyers, and perhaps you may say there's no great need for lawyers to speak to each other about the rule of law. Um, after all, we practice it every day. Aren't we meant to know what it means? But do we really know what it means? Or more practically, do we really know what our role as lawyers can be or should be to advance the principles and the values that underlie this lofty idea of rule of law? I don't know about you, but until very recently, when I decided to get involved in the law society here, um, I did not think very much about the rule of law, I have to admit. I practiced law, yes. You could ask me about how to take security, how to structure financing across borders, or how to position a company in an upcoming litigation. But in all honesty, the last time I seriously thought about the law and the values and principles that it gives expression to was in law school. Among the myriad of courses I took on all the subjects you all know that one has to face in first year law school, contract, family, criminal law, there was one course that was obligatory in first year and that was called Foundations. In that course, we learned about the great philosophers, theologians and thinkers who each in their own way and collectively have shaped the way we think about the law today. But since then, how much thinking have I done about that trait that I've chosen, that profession, the law, and around which I have built my career, not much. So today we are all experiencing an extreme situation. It has been more than a year of a global pandemic, making its effect felt through all the structures of our societies, from our institutions to our health infrastructure, right down to our families and our most intimate relations. So what about the law and all that? Well, the picture, as Stephanie pointed out, is not a good one. Court closures, for example, causing endless delays in the administration of justice. Emergency powers being used by states with motives and for purposes going much beyond what perhaps can be justified by the current circumstances. And if a pandemic wasn't enough, it seems as the world as a whole is slowly dividing up into large factions, poles of competition, both economically, politically, and perhaps, hopefully not soon, militarily, who knows? Increasingly, it seems, we learn of judiciaries whose independence have been curtailed, of lawyers who get associated with their clients and are punished for no other reason than to defend their clients. They're punished for doing their job. And if perhaps in the last century, many of us were under the impression that the whole world was moving along some linear path towards greater acceptance of all those values that underpin what we understand by the rule of law, who still has those illusions today? So the time is right to take stock. As a society, yes. As a profession, yes, also. But also as individuals and as lawyers and practitioners. And to ask ourselves, what about the law? What about me? What about my role in all this? For the law, is not just a trade or a profession or an area that one can become an expert in. The law is also a vocation, or a vocation to advance justice in all its forms, not just how we resolve disputes, but also in how we conceive of our relationships, our relationships to the state, to authority, within our countries, cities, communities, how we conceive of the power of the state and importantly its limitations and its reach, and when and how such power should be subject to challenge by the individual who remains the focus of our moral universe. So the question is, what can I do to give relevance to the rule of law and what can I do to protect it and advance it? To help us answer these questions, we have here today with us five panelists, all from very different areas of the practice of law, experts in their own rights, yes, certainly, but also individuals who've made the advancement of justice and thereby the rule of law a key part of their career. Now, as lawyers, we always like to define things. Contract lawyers will know the first sections of any contract are the definitions. And so I'd like to start this webinar today by, by calling on Ian McDougall, who is the Vice President and General Counsel at LexisNexis and who is joining us today from New York to help us understand what perhaps ought to be meant by the rule of law. 
Ian is the president of LexisNexis, of, of, the, of, of the LexisNexis Rule of Law Foundation, which is a nonprofit charitable organization established to advance the rule of law. He also sits on the United Nations Rule of Law Steering Committee and is a member of the UN General Council Advisory Board. Ian, so my first question is to you. For most lawyers, the rule of law might be a familiar concept. But in my interactions with non-lawyers, I've often been struck that many do not have a clear understanding of the term. Even among lawyers, is there a commonly accepted definition? And in promoting the rule of law, whether on the policy front or in our engagement with the business community, would we as lawyers be more effective if instead of using the term rule of law, we focused on the principles underlying what we understand the rule of law to be? such as accountability, open government, equality before the law, accessible justice, just laws, for example. Ian, over to you. Thanks very much. And um, let me say that uh, that broad group of questions, I'm going to take the next 10 minutes to have a go answering them, which is, uh, I have to say, a bit of a challenge because normally uh, uh, this, this uh, uh, occupies a lecture series uh, for me. But um, Firstly, um, can I thank the organizers and fellow panelists for the honor of kicking off this, uh, this web with them. Um, I'll be followed by an amazing set of speakers. If I can adapt Abraham Lincoln, the world will little note nor long remember what I say here, but it will surely not forget what my fellow panelists say. Um, I hope my comments are a general introduction to the subject from about 30,000 feet in my opinion, of course, and that my uh, fellow panelists are obviously going to delve deeper into more um, specific areas. Uh, I think we'll all be a little hamstrung by the limited time we have to develop any point, but we have to keep raising the rule of law uh, profile. So if I can start by uh, explaining a definition of the rule of law that we use, and which has been designed specifically for the business community on a global basis. Now, I know that this webinar has been designed by the legal community, but let me emphasize to you that the legal community is also the business community too. Um, there are, as I think has been um, highlighted, many extant definitions of the rule of law. In fact, um, I think it seems there are as many definitions as there are people who have looked at the issue. And talking of lawyers, I often say that if I asked seven lawyers to define the rule of law, I'd get eight different definitions. So I'm also aware of the irony that I'm about to give you another definition, um, but I want to explain why I think our approach has been different. At the United Nations, for example, the rule of law appears in the preamble to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. They wrote two further reports on the subject in 2002, 2004 to discuss the point. How did they arrive at their definitions? Um, if I can call umpteen pages of closely written compromised text a definition. The approach is usually to gather a group of sophisticated people in a room and haggle about what they all thought it meant, um, eventually arriving at some compromised text. We took a different approach. We approached our definition, firstly recognizing that the world is not one homogenous social, political or economic system. We wanted to ensure that the world's view was properly represented. I always say that we have to stop sounding like the West telling the rest how to behave. And we also wanted to approach the issue with the global business community in mind and to the maximum extent we could remove as much of the politics from the debate as we could. We wanted to look at the history of what societies around the world had understood the meaning to be, even if they didn't necessarily call it rule of law specifically. So we considered such things as the Code of Hammurabi, 1760 BC, Arabic scholarship from the Middle Ages, Islamic law scholarship, the main moral and philosophical traditions across the Asian continent, such as Upanishad uh, in India, and then through to Magna Carta. Now, as I said, I'll have to be very brief and rather superficial. I don't have time for all the supporting points, which usually, as I say, takes up a considerable lecture. But we're ultimately led to a simple four point definition. You should also bear in mind that these definitions cover a huge number of consequential necessary subcategories, but these are the four um, interlinked points. Point number one, equality before the law. In other words, 
the law is applied in the same way, regardless of who you are. In this context, I especially mean it applies to governments, ministers, presidents, and monarchs, as it does to the citizen. Point two, an independent judiciary. This means a judiciary free from outside influences, whether they be political or corruption, and who decide cases based on the evidence and the law with point one in mind. Point three, access to the law. In other words, the law must be known or capable of being known by the population generally. Nobody should be subject to secrets or retrospective laws. Such, you know, unless you can know what the law is, you can't seek its protection. Point four, access to remedy. Unless you can get access to remedy, uh, to remedy your grievance, then ultimately the other points don't really amount to very much. Without access to remedy, the law can simply be ignored, uh, leading to all kinds of um, unfortunate breakdown. Now, hopefully, uh, to make this a bit interesting, I might introduce a bit of controversy here. You may note the absence of the reference to democracy and human rights in, uh, in that definition. Now, I don't have time to talk about all of the reasons for their absence, which are uh, frankly fully and extensively developed, but uh, briefly and by way of example, democracy is an what you might call an axiomatic exclusion. If a clause of a definition is actually harmful to the thing you are defining, then as a matter of logic, it can't be in the definition. And given the massively harmful impact of populism on the rule of law, specifically, popularly supported attacks on the independence of the judiciary, for example, it makes a nonsense of a definition to, do, to include something that actually harms the thing you're defining. Now, please don't misunderstand me. These areas are crucial. There's no question about it. As Winston Churchill said, democracy is the worst system except for all the others that have been tried. And nobody seriously questions the need for human rights. But these issues must first have the foundation of the rule of law, otherwise they simply don't work properly. This uh, four point definition is simple to use, applies in practically any environment, and is one we use to try to engage the business community in advancing the rule of law. Our definition is as non-political yet meaningful as it's possible to be. And I should at this point say advancing instead of supporting the rule of law, because obviously supporting the rule of law can mean putting up um, uh, some text on your website saying how much you value it and not doing a lot more. We actually advocate that people should be helping to advance uh, the rule of law. It is, however, a definition which when implemented fully leads to a prosperous and stable society. It may lead to other beneficial social developments that can then expand the rule of law into a broader definition, but that's for that society to determine. In that sense, I should take a moment to refer to the definition espoused by Lord Taylor in his work on the subject. This is what's often referred to as a broad definition. The term narrow uh, is often meant pejoratively, but I reject that. The broad definition is also wider than is necessary for the business community and wider than is necessary to make start, make a start, to make progress. Also, if I may respectfully say so, Lord Taylor's definition has the disadvantage of once again looking like the West telling the rest how to behave. I suggest the definition I've presented is more likely to succeed because of its more general applicability. The rule of law, as you've heard previously, is the foundation of all other rights. If we get the foundation in place, lots of other benefits follow from that. From the business community perspective, there are many activities which are designed to promote general well-being. Companies have anti-human trafficking policies, environment policies, anti-corruption policies, etc. Increasingly, all kinds of organizations have significant corporate social responsibility programs for a whole variety of reasons. But without the elements of the rule of law that I've outlined, all of these activities and policies are just words on a piece of paper without any real effect or power. You can't achieve anything in all those other areas without having the foundation of the rule of law in place, or at the very least, progress is delayed or obstructed. No rule of law, no effective contract system. No rule of law, no effective land law process. No rule of law, no real protection against personal injury. 
and no rule of law, as we heard the president of the Law Society emphasize, no environmental protection. There's no criminal justice system that works effectively either, and so on and so on. And all of these areas are fundamental too to a successful business environment and therefore to a successful national environment and prosperity generally. But we've also tried to introduce a new concept into the campaign to advance the rule of law, naked self-interest. For example, we know that wherever the rule of law is stronger, per capita GDP is higher. Per capita, I emphasize. Infant mortality rates are lower. Homicide rates are lower and so on. And if you take a look at the LexisNexis rule of law index tracker, it's an interactive tool. If you move the rule of law elements by just a tiny amount, you can add over $600 of per capita GDP. And often that's more than the existing total per capita GDP. The United Nations recently estimate, estimated that 5 billion people currently live outside the protection of the rule of law. Not only is that a moral issue, but think of the wasted economic potential that the world is missing out on. In other words, we have to remind people that this is not some academic subject of interest to those of us who enjoy webinars. It makes a real difference to the life and prosperity of everyone. Our mission must be to reconnect the ideas of the rule of law with the general population. And yes, lawyers too. We have to remind people susceptible to populist rhetoric that the biggest danger we currently face to the rule of law around the world are people who appeal to our baser instincts for short-term gain. Giving in to these knee-jerk reactions to problems, usually involving the abandonment of rule of law principles, does harm in the long term to everyone. An important part of our mission must be to explain and constantly link the rule of law to the lives of all people, as I say, not just to those attending rule of law webinars. The connection between the rule of law and economic prosperity is beyond doubt. Again, I point to the evidence previously mentioned on the Lexis Rule of Law website and to the evidence displayed on the World Justice Project web website, amongst others. These show a close correlation between the rule of law and a wide variety of socioeconomic measures. So I appeal to you all, not only to do what you can to help advance the rule of law, but to constantly strive to link the importance of the rule of law to the lives of everyone. You'll see coming up a little later from some wonderful examples from fellow panelists of the difference that can be made on the ground and also uh, they'll be talking about their particular areas. The real challenge we face, and it's one where I believe the business community also has an important role, is to make that connection and to get people to realize generally the importance of the rule of law to their lives. Thank you all for your time and for this um, opportunity. And I hope at least that answered some of the questions um, uh, and perhaps provoked some interest. Thank you, and it sure did. And you, you sure did provide us with a definition. Um, but I'm afraid to say perhaps not an uncontroversial one, but before we, before we talk more about it, and I'm sure we will have lots of things to say about it, um, let's, let's dive deeper into the topic. And so I'd like to now get the view from the judiciary and I'd like to welcome to this panel um, Honorable, the Honorable Justice Robin Knowles, um, who is, uh, who sits in the Commercial Court, uh, the Administrative Court and the Court of Appeal, Criminal Division here in England and Wales. Before appointment to the High Court, he sat as a recorder in the Crown Court for 15 years and is a Deputy High Court Judge in both the Commercial Court and the Chancery Division. He's a member of the Financial Markets Law Committee and Chairman of the International Committee of the Judicial College of England and Wales. He has a career long involvement in the encouragement and coordination of legal pro bono work nationally and internationally, and is on the board of a number of charities in the field, including the Bauer Pro Bono Unit and the National Pro Bono Center. So welcome to this panel, Justice Knowles. And my question to you is here, here in England, as you know, we take a certain pride in the popularity across the globe of English law and the legal services being widely used for commercial transactions out of the UK. At the same time, we recognize the strength and contributions 
of many other legal systems around the world, whether from a civil or a common law tradition. What is the relationship between the rule of law on the one hand and aspects of a country's domestic legal system, including the independence and work of its judiciary and the independence of its legal profession? Uh, Christoph, uh, uh, Chairman, thank you ver very much indeed, and greetings to all involved um, in this project. The rule of law is one of the most powerful forces for good that we know. It enables change, and it also helps us to manage change. Increasingly and correctly, the connection between the rule of law and increased safety, stability and prosperity is made. Those alone are attractive outcomes to all, but then there is the connection between the rule of law and equality, accountability and reduced poverty, fairer transactions, fewer conflicts, greater responsibility in development, sustainable engagement with the environment, and more. These are enormous, enormous benefits. And all these can come from confidence and trust in a legal system. I have often been asked in all parts of the world what it is that causes parties to accept a decision of a court or arbitral tribunal. And I find the word trust or confidence in my answer. And I find that that answer is understood. The relationship between business investment and trust in enforceable business dispute resolution gives us a well-evidenced example touched on already on this occasion. Let me take a powerful expression of this from the other side of the world. The High Court in South Korea is presided over by Judge Sung Kyung Yoon. He considered the situation where the court of a nation failed to show its fairness by choosing to favor its own citizen when justice required a decision against that citizen and in favor of a foreign interest. His observation was that the court was harming the more important national interest in exchange for the private interest of the specific individual. And for national interest, Judge Sung Kyung Yun might have said national and international interest. A legal system earns confidence and trust from the presence and the work of a strong and independent legal profession and judiciary. And I wish with your permission to spend a few moments to discuss how the work of a strong and independent legal profession and judiciary goes beyond their contribution to individual decisions in individual cases and goes beyond even the development of the law through those cases. As Christoph, our chairman said in his opening remarks, there is a question with which we must grapple. What is our role? And I touch on four examples in the time available. I fully acknowledge and emphasize that each one requires care, discretion, and judgment. My first example is work on access to justice. Many people in this country do not in practice have access to professional help with the law and that in a system that requires professional help. In some judgments, the judiciary has shown, it's expressed how central 
access to justice and legal aid are to the rule of law. But judgments require parties to bring cases. They cannot simply be volunteered. Beyond what is said or expressed in its judgment, the judiciary has perhaps held back, held back in saying what needs to be said, and I question whether it should. The judiciary and the legal profession have great knowledge of what is not working. The data available to the judiciary could inform so much. I do not believe that the judiciary compromises its independence when it speaks on the very working of the legal system. And I do believe that the rule of law needs this. If the system is in practice closed too many. And those who want the benefit of the rule of law in business and in trade must recognize that if parts of our legal system are not in good health, then that is relevant to the health of the entire system, including its operation in the field of business and trade. My second example is work on an ethos of service in a legal system. It is the job of the judiciary to decide between interests, and this can lead a judiciary to isolate itself. However, if a judiciary is to decide well, then it needs to hear from its users about what could be improved, what could be of better service in the resolution of disputes. Of course, care must be taken to use appropriate channels. And in this successful engagement with the legal profession and of the judiciary and the legal profession together with ultimate users is so important. A special effort is required in relation to vulnerable users. The rule of law requires this ethos of service in a legal system. Let me take third an example about work on the relationship between courts and arbitration or other forms of dispute resolution. The approach of our courts is rightly to support arbitration and thereby the responsible choice of parties. But in arbitration, the focus is often when courts are discussed on the subject of enforcement of awards. Of course, that is important, access to remedy, Ian's point four. But the judiciary also sees something of the rest of arbitration, of the cost and time that arbitration can take, as indeed can litigation. And however unpopular this may be, the courts, in my view, need to be ready to raise that subject and any subject that goes to standards in arbitration. Arbitration will ultimately be the stronger and healthier for it, and that is what I would wish to see. But the rule of law demands this as well. My fourth and final example is work on public awareness of the law especially through public legal education. In this, in my view, we have so much to do in this jurisdiction. The public may trust the legal system, but the foundations of that trust are not currently built on knowledge and understanding of the law and its administration. In these times, and for the future, foundations of that quality, foundations of knowledge and understanding are needed. Yet, and although I salute important efforts that have been made, we still ultimately do very little to this end. 
and we could do so much more without undue difficulty. Even the public database of our legislation is not always up to date. And we are currently expecting a charity to raise funds to keep the overarching database of our judgments going. Public legal education is ultimately vital to the rule of law. Now you will have other examples. And in all this, it is worth reflecting on the sheer scale of the opportunity that is there for the judiciary and the legal profession to work in partnership in service of the rule of law. I am in this jurisdiction beyond grateful, beyond grateful for the relationship between the judiciary, the law society, the Bar Council, and the Chartered Institute of Legal Executives, alongside specialist associations and charities, together committed to this end. The opportunity for relationship and partnership in service of the rule of law is, however, global. And this webathon illustrates that well. And so the work of UIA, IBA, Roll UK, the ABA, and others, including the international team at the Law Society, the Judicial Office, and our ministries, and many others, can enable this sense of relationship and partnership in service of the rule of law. The Standing International Forum of Commercial Courts has promotion of the rule of law as one of its three objectives. Its growing membership of judiciaries now reaches across the G20, the Commonwealth, the common law and civil law world, and the developing world too. Sometimes international engagement may be difficult or unpopular, but sometimes with trust and respect built and with care and patience, the law can open the conversation internationally on a difficult subject central to the rule of law in a way that politics cannot. It may be the business law engagement that will make the relationship and build the trust that can lead in time to the engagement on human rights or the environment. Certainly, the business law engagement will already have put the advantages of a strong and independent legal profession and judiciary center stage. So ultimately, the rule of law offers so much. It is so central to all that we do. Yet it needs work all the time. As an illustration of how present the rule of law is, I was struck last week by remarks from the treasurer of Gray's Inn, Ali Malik, QC in a valuable lecture that he delivered. He said it, the rule of law, is of daily relevance, even when we do not notice it. And when we do notice it, it is usually in response to something serious. When the rule of law won its place in Sustainable Development Goal 16, it was high time now that the rule of law is there in the Sustainable Development Goals, we must renew our efforts to make the most of it. In making the most of it, we each have a part to play. And what a privilege it is to be a lawyer. But with that privilege comes our need to continue to commit to the very considerable amount of work to be done to advance the rule of law, as Ian rightly urged. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justice Knowles, for this very inspirational intervention, I have to say, and for reminding us that we all have a role to play 
in advancing the rule of law and the principles that underlie it. Um, again, I think we'll have more things to say about that towards the end of this session. And I'd like to now move on to something that Ian's already touched on when he mentioned that there is a relationship between the rule of law and economic development. And so my next speaker, I'm very pleased to present on this panel, Dame Fiona Wolf. Uh, Dame Fiona is an energy and infrastructure lawyer and a former partner with Cameron McKenna and Navarro Oldsman. She has advised many of the world's transmission companies and system operators, as well as 28 governments and the World Bank on electricity reforms and infrastructure projects. She was president of the Law Society of England and Wales uh, and Lord Mayor of London. Dame Fiona, thank you for joining us. Um, much has been written and published about the relationship between law and economic development. Joseph Stieglitz, former World Bank chief economist, wrote about how easily enforceable property rights, for example, can stimulate growth, or how the retention of intellectual property rights can limit such growth, which is especially relevant in the current COVID crises. I work for an international development bank, the EBRD, and the criticism I often hear is that an insistence on the rule of law usually comes too late and then is used to lend legitimacy to upholding the negative reputation of a post-conflict country that urgently needs economic development. Some think the rule of law is a privileged status one can only afford after a country has reached a certain level of economic development. Dame Fiona, in your opinion, what is the right way for us to think about the relationship between law and development? Thank you, Christoph, um, and thank you to all the organizers for inviting me to this incredibly exciting event, 24 hours all around the world, uh, in some of the loveliest organizations that I've had the privilege of being uh, involved with during my time at the Law Society and as, as Lord Mayor. Well, in reply to your question, it will come as no surprise to anyone that the relationship between the rule of law and successful economic development is both fundamental and close. And as a lawyer, as you've heard, specialising in the electricity industry, I've worked all over the world, particularly with multilateral development banks, MDBs, such as the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank on projects to increase the availability of clean, affordable electricity to serve what is often quite a chronic unmet need, which is holding back the achievement of many of the sustainable development goals, including economic development. And this MDB work has been crucial in post-conflict countries which struggle to attract investment, which will provide the basis for stability, both economic and societal. They can quickly become caught in a downward spiral that creates more civil unrest and conflict. And although my specialist skills are focused on generation and transmission projects and electricity markets and trading arrangements, and my mother once said, there doesn't seem to be much law in that, dear. Um, my starting point has always been to create the framework where the rule of law can prevail and build the country's credibility as a place I was going to say in which to invest, but um, Robin has used a better word, which is as a place to trust. Every country knows that it needs to invest for economic growth. And at this moment, it is particularly critical because we must do that in a way that tackles climate change. The good news from the Stern report, which is over 10 years old now, is that if we invest for green growth, it won't actually cost us much more. So let me tell you a couple of stories of where we were able to help post-conflict countries to attract investment for green growth by creating a new rule of law framework and grouping them with their neighboring countries which share their interests in increasing their supplies of clean, affordable electricity for their own economic development. I mean, you've heard what the fundamental elements of the rule of law requirements are. And thank you, Ian, for simplifying them 
Um, everything that I've read was complex and then some. Um, uh, I, and you've heard about enforceable property rights from Joseph Stiglitz, one of my great heroes. Uh, I would add to that modern company and contract law are important, as is the ability to hold the state to account. But in a post-conflict context, the investors are not just looking for certainty, as they call it, but also looking for the tools to prevent backsliding by the state, and not just the protection against expropriation without compensation. Whilst corruption, the restoration of law and order and other reforms are being tackled. The first of my two case studies relates to Central America and a project known as CPAC, which is involved in building a high voltage transmission line all the way up Central America from Panama to Guatemala. And with it, the creation of a regional wholesale market in electricity designed to serve all six countries at lowest cost. The countries and their electricity industries were and are all different. Some had electricity to export and some had a shortage of affordable supply um, uh, such that there was significant unmet need holding economic and social development back. The post-conflict country of Nicaragua was struggling to attract any foreign direct investment. The six countries all shared an economic interest in the new regional market an investment in power plants utilizing the, regionals, the region's natural capital, otherwise known as sunshine and wind, would become much more attractive if the developer knew that it could sell into a market serving all six countries. However, for that, a rule of law regime having equal strength in each country needed to be created. At its foundation, was a complex treaty that took several years, actually more like a decade to negotiate, but was thought through in immense detail. It gave effect both to the transmission line project and the detailed rules of the very sophisticated regional market based on some of the best market design around the world. By its terms and through the ratification procedures of the legislatures in each country, the treaty and all the rules and regulations to which it referred became legally enforceable in each country as if they were incorporated into domestic law. The treaty was remarkable in that it also set up regional institutions, not just for decision-making governments and dispute resolution, but also a regional system operator and a regional regulator. And the composition of the, these bodies um, in their frontline positions consisted of one member of the regulatory commission in each country for the regional regulator and one member for the equivalent, from the equivalent for the regional system operator. And this was designed to ensure consistency of approach and act, act as a force for convergence and adoption of best practice. They are key to unlocking the efficiency um, and sharing of resources across borders, better for the economies and for the planet. You can imagine my delight when I met the Minister of Energy um, of Nicaragua at a conference at Lancaster House in London, where the G7 are meeting today, who told me that there had been a very substantial increase in foreign direct investment in renewable generation in his country, now that the regional transmission line and the new market were in service. And the power flows between the countries have even been such that a second circuit is being installed in stages. My second case is a uh, study about the world, the power of the rule of law in unlocking economic development. It's very different. It relates to Liberia and Sierra Leone, both recovering from conflict, and their neighbours, Cote d'Ivoire and Guinea. It's similar to the CPAC project in concept, the construction of a transmission line linking the four countries and a new, rather simpler regional market with the object of fulfilling the very considerable unmet need for electricity and attracting investment, particularly in renewables. The challenge here was to develop a legal framework that would create the necessary certainty between the states the MDBs and investors in two civil law countries and two common law countries, which had some understandable weaknesses in their in institutions and legal systems. 
An entirely new legal system was created for the project, utilising the best of both civil and common law. A lot of time was saved by incorporating some of the simple harmonised business laws, modernised, developed by the organisation of for the harmonisation of business law in Africa, known as OHADA, and I'm sure some of you will know it, of which Cote d'Ivoire and Guinea are two of the 17 African country members. Its website explains that, and then I quote, OHADA was created in the context of acute economic crisis and a drastic fall of investment level in Africa. Legal and judicial insecurity were identified as a major cause of investor distrust. The obsolescence, disparity and inaccessibility of rules governing economic operations led to legal insecurity materialized by the difficulty to determine the applicable rule in a given operation. OHADA has produced 10 uniform acts for member states to adopt which provide up-to-date harmonized business laws designed to, as they put it, guarantee the legal security of economic activities. A detailed international project agreement and associated suite of documents incorporating common civil law and OHADA provisions um, was put in place, but we could always call, fall back on OHADA principles where there were vacuums and that was done. They were carefully scrutinized by the multilateral development banks, um, as, uh, as Christoph will tell you, um, who, and who were funding the project. They had to be able to fulfill their role in holding everyone to account. Just as important, the states themselves were keen to be able to hold each other to account because they had a common economic interest. And the project is nearing completion, and that would not have happened without this innovative rule of law framework. So in conclusion, economic development is usually regarded as the province of economists, investors, and lenders. The MDBs have discovered that the, the, the hard way that bringing in lawyers only when you've decided what you want to do will waste a lot of time and probably a lot of money. The rule of law is as fundamental to successful economic development as it is to everything else in a fair society. As we have seen in my two examples, it also provides a platform for collab collaboration between states, which is fundamental if we are to take care of our planet and use our increasingly scarce resources efficiently. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dame Fiona. Um, really interesting. And I think that when you ask the average person about the rule of law, most of them will think about something that happens domestically in, in their country. And here you've given us two very good examples of how the rule of law, law can benefit people, improve people's lives when it, when it gets implemented in an international, in a treaty type setting. So that, that's absolutely fascinating. And that, that leads me to our next panelist, uh, Sir Ian McLeod, who is legal advisor at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Um, Sir Ian worked at the UK representation to the European Commission and at the UK mission to the UN uh, and was seconded to the Attorney General's office. Subsequently, he was deputy legal advisor at the Home Office and then legal advisor at the Central Advisory Division and the Treasury Solicitor's Department before taking up his present post. Welcome to our panel, Sir Ian. Now, at the Law Society, uh, where, I, where I'm involved in, especially at our International Committee, as Lisette knows, we spend a lot of time discussing how best to engage with countries that do not share the UK's democratic and liberal values as we want to both advance our members' commercial interests and be a force of good in promoting the rule of law. In many jurisdictions, for example, the interpretation of the rule of law could be inter narrowly interpreted as the rule by law, which leaves out vital aspects of the rule of law as we know it. I'm sure many in our audience would not consider the rule by law to be consistent with their understanding of the rule of law. 
as lawyers and members of bar associations involved in policy dialogue, both domestically and internationally, how can we have an effective dialogue on this issue with countries and policymakers that do not share our values? Well, thank you, Christoph, and um, thank you to the Law Society for extending their invitation to me to join this panel. Um, I'm delighted to see the rule of law taking such a central place in our discussion, and I'm honoured to be part of this discussion. <clears throat> so the United Kingdom stands for democratic liberal values, for, for government under the law. And these ideas permeate government policy for many years, including the recent integrated review of security, defence, development and foreign policy. Among other things, that document and that policy prioritises open societies and rule of law and commits to support for open societies through building the capacity of justice systems and institutions by drawing on the global reputation and unique experience of our own legal services and the common law system. The direction that the UK government has set is therefore very clear. But as you note, rule of law is very different from rule by law. One places government under authority, the other makes government the ultimate authority. So the dilemma you and your members face is a difficult one, which the UK government and UK policymakers also face. So how then does the government promote its values in a world where these values and aims are not necessarily shared by those we have to interact with? Part of the answer may lie with a new question, of course. Even where a state or a foreign policymaker doesn't share all of our values, it may still share some, or at least share some of our aims. And focusing on those commonalities, taking time to identify common ground, can be a first step towards navigating those areas where we do not see eye to eye. The integrated review mentions China a lot. China's values are very different to ours in many areas, and this presents challenges. But as the review describes, we use a robust diplomatic framework to manage disagreements, defend our values, and preserve space for cooperation where our interests align. Diplomacy requires patience, and it requires an appreciation of the culture and interests of those sitting across the table. China is an increasingly important partner in tackling global challenges like pandemic preparedness, biodiversity, and climate change. And we can find common ground and work with China on these fronts, while being prepared to assert and enforce our values and our interests where they are threatened or not understood. Second, we take advantage of channels of dialogue with other countries through our membership of and leadership in international, in international institutions. As a permanent member of the UN Security Council and an active participant in international organizations of all kinds, covering all issues and all parts of the world, the UK uses its influence and presence to promote its values and the rule of law. The UK's leadership of the G7 and later in the year COP26 present new opportunities to engage with other nations and policymakers on acute issues of contemporary concern. We also make the most of the many assets we have, including, as we have heard, our legal sector and law. Our judiciary and our legal professions are renowned for technical excellence and for integrity. By exchanging best practice, discussing priorities, identifying opportunities, and sharing tools and expertise, we build a strategic, influential, and capable UK rule of law offer. Drawing in our respective networks and combined convening powers, we are more equipped to reach those countries and policymakers with whom we seek to engage. We also look for and grasp opportunities for engagement, recognising that opportunities may exist and may appear where we least expect to find them. Like so many countries, the UK has found itself balancing the imperative to act against the COVID-19 pandemic, whilst upholding the rule of law domestically. But COVID-19 has also driven important changes and reforms that may provide a model for others, including the adoption of digital technologies in our court systems that might serve to increase access and deal with case backlogs. And I note the positive impact that UK judges have had in this area, engaging with judiciaries across the Commonwealth and more broadly to share best practice. Finally, we can open doors to dialogue and to promote promoting our values by sharing our expertise internationally. British justice is a world leader, with London becoming a global centre for dispute resolution. 
The Rural UK programme, which we've heard of, draws on the talents of our legal firms by deploying pro bono professional legal expertise to build partnerships overseas. They have been working, for example, in Nepal to enshrine um, new economic and social protections in law and partnering local NGOs with British lawyers to improve their legal knowledge. So our academic institutions and legal think tanks and NGOs are very much part of this expertise too. So to return to your search and question, I think for government and for your members, the tools and techniques for advancing your values are fundamentally the same. An openness to dialogue, patient diplomacy, seizing opportunities, making the most of the assets we have, not least the influence, networks and convening power of our own rule of law stakeholders, such as those gathered and represented here. Thank you, Christoph. Thank you very much, Sir Ian. Um, well, I think we'll go back to, again, we'll go back to some of the themes that you touched on. Um, just as Knowles, you mentioned earlier that sometimes we take the rule of law for granted and then we notice it when something terrible has happened. And so I'm pleased to welcome as my next panelist, someone who has been uh, really uh, on the front line of dealing with um, situations where terrible things have happened. I'm pleased to welcome to this panel um, judge Joanna Corner, her honour Judge Joanna Corner, who is a judge uh, of the Crown Court of England and Wales and has been for the last 26 years. Uh, judge Corner previously spent eight years as senior prosecuting trial attorney at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, acting as lead prosecutor in the trials of political and military leaders accused of the gravest international crimes. She regularly provides advocacy training to judges and lawyers across the world, including to, including to staff of UN ag agencies and the International Criminal Court. Um, Judge Corner, in, in the 2020 Rule of Law Index, a US-based world justice project, it was noted that more countries declined than improved in overall rule of law performance, now for a third year in a row, and continuing a negative slide toward weakening and stagnating rule of law around the world. The negative trend was particularly pronounced in areas such as fundamental rights, constraints on government, absence of corruption. Now the pandemic has played a significant role in the backsliding of the rule of law with the introduction of emergency laws which have limited fundamental rights and freedoms and the slowdown of the courts and tribunals. How has the pandemic exacerbated, exacerbated pre-existing problems and what do you perceive those problems to be and what steps should be taken by legal professionals to improve the current situation? Uh, you're, you're on mute. The buzz phrase of the year, you're on mute. Um, uh, Chris, can I thank you very much indeed for your um, introduction and just one small correction. Um, I've only been a full-time jo judge for the last 12 years, but I was a, I've been a part-time jo judge for the uh, 26 years um, uh, that you mentioned. And can I thank you and the Law Society for, um, like all the other panelists, for inviting me to take part in this um, obviously fascinating event. Um, can I start? with the general and then perhaps illustrate it with the particular. I think it's quite obvious that the rule of law requires courts to operate, all courts, but above all the criminal courts, so that the victims of crimes can receive justice uh, and those accused of crime can have a verdict on whether they are guilty or not by a properly constituted court. So that's the first and, and, and most obvious um, general observation to make. So can I turn to the particular as an illustration? The first lockdown um, in England, and I emphasize in England because Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland all had different dates, began on the 23rd of March of last year. And I was then presiding over a trial of four young men who were all charged with serious robberies of, of high value watches the alleged offence or offences had taken place in September of 2019. 
It was like every criminal trial in this country, one in which involved 12 members of the public sitting as a jury. And by the 23rd of March, the trial had been running for about two weeks and it had reached the stage of final speeches by counsel. After the lockdown was announced, I told the jury that in the light of the announcement um, uh, and that the direction that anybody in particular at risk should not leave home, if they had any concerns, they should let me know. And I sent them out to consider that. Four members of the jury expressed such concern. That meant that the whole jury had to be discharged uh, because there would have been insufficient numbers to reach a proper verdict. Uh, we do not have alternates here as in um, uh, the United States. Uh, and there has to be at least nine for a verdict to be reached. And I had to order a retrial. Two of the four accused had been kept in custody since their arrest. And with considerable reluctance, I granted them bail. Uh, the reason they had not earlier been given bail was because they had long criminal records. And so there was a strong possibility either that they would carry on committing offenses uh, or alternatively would not turn up for the trial uh, because if they were convicted, the sentence of imprisonment were likely to be long ones. But I granted them bail because it was impossible to know when jury trials would restart. They in fact only began again in my particular court in July of last year. Uh, no court held jury trials before May. Uh, the jury trials that we restarted were ones that would last no more than about three days uh, because we felt it would not be right uh, to bring members of the public in the middle of um, the pandemic um, to a court building. Uh, the official backlog for trials uh, across England and Wales by August of 2020 was 46,500 trials, and indeed more according to the Ministry of Justice. The retrial of this case, because of the pandemic restrictions, could only be relisted to start in January of this year. On the day that it was due to start, uh, one of the defendants was diagnosed with COVID-19. And so the trial had to be put off again uh, until July of this year. That experience is common, I am absolutely certain, not just to all the judges in my court, but across all the courts in the United Kingdom, and I've no doubt uh, most of the countries who, have, who are going to be represented in this webathon. And in my view, it's difficult to argue against not just the perception, but the reality that in the sphere of criminal justice in 2020, uh, the rule of law went into abeyance. There's no doubt that everybody did their best. Remote hearings took place. Technology, in order to, to assist with such hearings, uh, rather like vaccines, uh, which had been developing at a snail's pace uh, before 2020, suddenly had money thrown at them. So that within months, uh, the use by the courts of the creaking and outdated Skype for business, which caused almost more problems than it solved, had been replaced by the present system of what we all call CVP, uh, Cloud Video Platform, to give it its full title. And judges and lawyers and administrative staff adopted the use of this technology with varying degrees of skill, uh, but certainly with commitment. Uh, and despite media stories of judges appearing in pajamas, um, and counsel appearing in some very interesting clothing, not normally seen in a court in England or Wales. Uh, I don't think anything beat uh, the United States um, vision of the lawyer who kept having to declare that he was not a cat 
And uh, if we had time, I would put up that wonderful photograph that was in all the press. And hearings were held throughout the period to deal with pleas of guilty, bail applications, and other matters which did not involve trials. But as I say, inexorably, over the months, the backlog of trials increased. Uh, Cost-cutting measures by government had reduced the number of days which court could sit even before the pandemic. And as I said, uh, the backlog rose uh, to uh, some 46,500, but was already, before the pandemic started, 39,000 cases waiting to be tried. The House of Lords, when it issued its report last month um, on the progress of the criminal justice system and the COVID pandemic, identified, and I can't do better than just simply repeat what they said, the significant effects of the backlog. First, the parties uh, for a trial are waiting uh, several years for their cases to be heard. Uh, given the uh, time um, effect on memories, uh, the quality of justice is increasingly, said the House of Lords, at risk. Third, more people are being held on remand awaiting trial. Uh, the report noted that in December of last year, 8,000 adults and 130 children were being held on remand. And fourth, of course, the Crown Prosecution Service has to be selective in choosing which cases to prosecute. The trials have been prioritised to deal with custody cases. The court at which I sit, Southwark Crown Court, um, is largely one which deals with big cases of fraud. Uh, they are normally uh, defendants uh, the, in these cases on bail, but they are long and complex cases, so they go to the back of the queue. Uh, there were an estimated 3.8 million incidents of fraud in the year ending March 2019, which is about 34% of all reported crime. One doesn't have to read the press to see that that figure has risen, and it means that uh, a form of crime which is widespread and pernicious um, is not at the moment um, uh, being tried. I think probably the worst effect of the pandemic has been um, on the custody time limits. Uh, before September 2020, uh, the custody time limits were 26 weeks. After September 2020, they had been increased to 34 weeks, and the increase came about as a result of inconsistent judicial decisions relating to applications for the extension of custody time limits beyond what was then permitted by law. And it brought into play the ever-present conflict uh, between the rights of individuals, particularly that of the presumption of innocence until found guilty, and the right of the public to be protected from offenders who, if granted bail, uh, would commit further offences, which was, as I say, the case in the trial that I was doing, or would flee the jurisdiction uh, to the detriment of the victims of their crimes. And all of that aggravated by the knowledge that conditions in prisons which have never been great in this country, uh, were made significantly worse by COVID. Prisoners were kept in their cells for 23 hours. Uh, they were unable or denied to see or, or denied access to lawyers simply because lockdown prevented uh, prison visits in person and prisons were unable to accommodate the number of requests for video conferences. And a further effect um, on, came on the ability to pass a sentence on conviction which fitted the crime. Delay in trial is a factor which judges have to take into account uh, when sentencing. Uh, a further factor that they had to take into account, as the Court of Appeal held, and rightly, was the prison conditions as a result of COVID. And so for the victims of crime, seeing low sentences being passed 
when they were victims of violent robbery or they lost their life savings being um, through the uh, fraud crime that was committed, of course, further reduces public confidence in the rule of law. Uh, the converse, uh, alternatives to imprison. All judges are urged because of the overcrowding uh, in prison not to pass prison sentences where there are community penalties available. Um, those penalties usually involve uh, drug rehabilitation orders to try and wean drug, drug addicts off drugs so that they stop committing crime to get the money to pay for them. Unpaid work, alcohol treatment orders, none of these matters um, were able to uh, uh, be uh, operated uh, during um, uh, the pandemic. And so, in answer to the question, <laughs> uh, what, what do I perceive the problems to be that have been uh, uh, exacerbated by the pandemic is and basically two aspects. Uh, firstly, the reduction by successive governments, and it matters not whether they're the, the Labour or, or Conservative or, or whatever, in allocating funds um, to the administration of the civil and criminal justice system. Uh, and a second and just as important matter is the reduction um, in overseas um, aid, which affects the ability of the UK, as, as Syrian has said, um, the rule of law here is, is, is rightly admired. And there has been a long tradition of us going to assist uh, particularly developing countries in uh, the implementation of, of the rule of law. Can I take first the reduction in funds and, and very quickly, because I think I've slightly run over my time. Uh, the result has already been, as we have seen, the backlog uh, in cases, but it's going further. Reduction in legal aid, assistance uh, to those who, um, not just in criminal cases, but also in civil um, claims, employment and the like, has meant that many more defendants are representing themselves because they simply cannot um, afford to pay lawyers themselves. That, of course, in turn affects the administration of justice. Uh, defendants representing themselves uh, usually take a lot more time because they don't know the law. Uh, they can't agree facts. Uh, they can't agree principles of law. Uh, and so more and more also judges are forced to step into the arena without uh, taking sides, but it becomes more and more difficult. The publicly funded lawyers are leaving um, publicly funded work in droves, not just uh, uh, barristers, uh, the advocates, uh, but also uh, firms of solicitors uh, who can no longer afford to operate. Um, the firms of solicitors, which were the ones uh, that uh, the general member of the public, not involved in a big commercial dispute, would go to. The high, what we call the high street solicitors. Uh, they are more and more being forced to retrench and not do that work any longer. Uh, the figures perhaps explain for the Criminal Bar Association has been active in trying to persuade the public, not, not all lawyers are fat cat lawyers. And the figures for the young bar doing publicly funded work explain exactly why that is. For the first three years of practice in the survey that was done um, last year, uh, no, 2019, sorry, full-time um, criminal barristers in, in their first uh, three years uh, of work and a pre-tax, pre and I emphasize, a pre-tax profit of some 12,000 uh, pounds in the years 2019 to 20, uh, with an average mean of 18,000 pounds. And the effect on diversity, on social mobility, 
hardly needs stating. It means that only the well-off at the moment um, can afford to go to the criminal bar. And even for the well-off, uh, earnings like that are unsustainable for any length of time. Uh, and uh, the drop-off of uh, the young bar uh, uh, between eight to 12 years practice in the last a uh, few years between 2016 and 2020, there has been a drop off of 50%. Uh, this, of course, is all exacerbated by the fact that so little work has been going on in, uh, uh, in the courts uh, as a result of COVID. And as for overseas aid, uh, it hardly needs saying that um, in November of last year, the Chancellor's spending review announced a reduction uh, in the overseas aid budget. Uh, instead of 0.7%, uh, uh, it will now be 0.5% of gross uh, national income. What can be done? I haven't the faintest idea. Um, all I can suggest uh, is uh, firstly that um, uh, as Sir Robin um, is well known for, more pro bono work needs to be done uh, by those who are in a position um, to do it. Um, more pressure needs to be brought uh, on MPs, on ministers, uh, on the like, uh, to uh, make sure that what has now taken place, which is, as I say, an upsurge in spending, uh, on the uh, justice system uh, is in fact maintained and continued um, even after the end of the pandemic. Um, and one last example, uh, the International Criminal Court, where I should be going, um, I hope, in September, um, it, it ran out of money um, at uh, the end of last year. Um, that is because um, a number of the state's parties who are supposed to fund the International Criminal Court simply have not paid their dues. It is almost certain, in my view, uh, that even countries who up till now have been good at paying the dues um, to the court will consider whether with the economic uh, crisis, in which most countries are, um, this comes high on their list of priorities to pay what is owing. Uh, and as we know, the International Criminal Court um, is becoming gradually more and more important uh, and is beginning to work rather more as those who founded it intended it should. So, uh, sorry, that was a bit of a rant, but um, you perhaps won't be surprised. Oh, well, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Judge Corner. It, it, you, you, you paint an incredibly gloomy picture of the current situation, which it is, and it's accurate, and it's a picture that was already not very good, even before the pandemic, as as many of us know. Um, I'd like to now open up the panel to to a few questions, um, and. One theme I'd like to go back to is what Justice Knowles ju touched on, which is trust. Trust as being the glue that holds it all together. And I'd like to link it to the definition that was provided of the rule of law by Ian McDougall in the beginning, which to me sounded like a definition that yes, would probably be appealing to the business community and a de definition that perhaps <coughs> consistently applied throughout time. You could look back at the Roman Empire or some other time in history and say, yes, that type of rule of law existed in some form and that was a good thing. But the question I have when you, is, is it really possible for us as a legal profession to speak credibly about the rule of law and to take up some of the issues that Judge Corner raised um, and to militate for them and to promote them, um, is it possible without linking it 
to human rights and to democracy? Is, it, is, is that separation possible? 300 years after the Enlightenment, when, when we all think about the individual slightly differently, perhaps, than we did in the past. And that's one question I have, and perhaps linked to that is, in order to be credible as a profession, the, the stories and the description, Judge Corner, that you provided of the crises in the criminal system obviously stands in, in huge contrast to other things that we learn about the legal profession. For example, that some of the corporate law firms are having the best years ever, ever, ever. Uh, partner profits beyond <laughs> imagination, really. And so coming back to trust and, and how we phrase the conversation, is there sufficient solidarity among the profession? among the rich and the poor and the people who are in, working on criminal law and business law, is there a sufficient level of commonality within our profession to address some of these issues? I'm asking really everybody uh, on this panel to, to please let me have your thoughts on this. I, I'd be happy to uh, start as I, uh, as I did uh, introduce the definition. Um, so um, effectively, um, uh, I think that the reverse approach, which is to include a broad based definition of the rule of law, which includes all kinds of things, which in my uh, suggestion are actually things which rely upon the rule of law rather than are part of the rule of law, um, is a mistake which we have made for many, uh, for many years. Um, uh, we've made that mistake by trying to explain to um, to other countries that the rule of law basically means you should run your uh, society the same way we do. And that gets us nowhere. What we have to do is put in place building blocks. The building blocks of the rule of law, as I've outlined them, hopefully necessarily lead to some of the other things you're talking about. So for example, point number one, which was equality before the law, uh, is a starting point. Um, access to remedy is another starting point. So that if you have um, uh, the idea that you're trying to promote human rights, which is a very good thing, but you have no access to remedy, you can't remedy the grievance, yeah? Then it doesn't really matter what other rights you're trying to advance nothing happens. And so my point here is twofold. One is that the definition uh, of the rule of law is um, a, a basic fundamental building block upon which other rights, including human rights, are built. And the other point is one which I think is a pragmatic one, which is that we must first put in place a general definition which can be acceptable in most places and that doesn't involve regime change, and that doesn't involve some fundamental threat to the people that we're talking to, but which can generate the uh, kind of um, society that we all think uh, is necessary. That's uh, how I would respond. Thank you. Uh, Justice Knowles, I believe you wanted to, to come in. I see that on the chats. Well, thanks, Christoph. Um, I just wanted to, um, offer a brief response to your question about the contrast between criminal practice and commercial practice over the pandemic, and your question about solidarity amongst the profession if the experiences were so different. Um, it, within um, England and Wales, the transaction of business by the commercial court um, and other business and property courts has, has held up strongly. Um, that is through the um, use of technology. Um, we've been able to compare notes with other jurisdictions um, about their experience too. Um, if we're looking at this in, 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 in rule of law terms, we must always take a, a longer view too. And with absolute respect, um, uh, uh, for the um, experience that Judge uh, Corner has identified during the pandemic. But one of the things that I think will come from the experience 
um, of use of technology in, in, in the commercial area uh, will be its further positive development where appropriate uh, in the criminal area too. Um, and this isn't just about the conduct of hearings. It's also about the use of technology as a channel for advice, the use of technology to, to reach um, um, uh, uh, those in, look, in search of advice and to reach them affordably as, as well. Um, you asked about solidarity amongst the profession. Uh, can I offer one example which warmed my heart and which showed a sense within the legal profession that it's one profession, even though the experiences are very different. Um, and that is the response of some of the commercial sets to fund pupillages in some of the criminal sets during the period of the pandemic. That sits alongside um, a, a greater response rather than lesser response uh, to volunteer for pro bono work. But it, it may be a small example, uh, but um, I think an important one. Thank you very much. Does anybody else want to come in? Yes, yeah, Dame Fiona. Two, two quick observations, one, one, one on, on, on each of your questions. I'm absolutely okay with Ian's definition. Um, I've been looking for a simplified version, perhaps all my legal career, um, to explain it um, at a dinner party or on a plane um, or, or whatever. And although um, I, 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 and I take your point about democracy and human rights, um, actually, uh, democracy is usually underpinned by some law. There is usually um, uh, an electoral regime, which is the subject of a law anyway. And, you know, we, we know we got the vote. We women, apart from anything else, celebrating uh, the passing of the Sex Disqualification Removal Act in 1919, um, were acutely aware that it was a passing of an act that did all that for us. So I don't know that you really... Um, I, I think it's a bit of a distraction to go there. I think that's that's maybe more of the sort of values territory that Sir Ian so eloquently spoke about. Um, as far as human rights are concerned, I think there are, I mean, there are lots and lots of rights that affect us again, which are um, underpinned by law. But um, I mean, in my case, um, we had to move a load of people outside the corridor along which transmission lines were built in those, those two countries. And we had to respect their human rights, which are not actually sort of really written down in any of these countries, but, 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 but as lawyers, we wanted to make sure that the, uh, um, the, the, the multilateral development banks, such as your own, who care that there were proper processes for looking after these communities were, were, were actually taken care of. And that's kind of, Kind of what we do, but um, but I, we absolutely do need a simplified version. Ian, I'm 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 with you on that. Um, as far as solidarity is concerned, I mean, you know, don't think that the big international firms don't think of this every day of the week. Um, uh, the rule of law um, is absolutely fundamental to the success of the the stuff that they're working on on a daily basis. Um, uh, especially when they are um, they're, they're, they're dealing with, um, uh, with with developing countries, and, and it, 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 or, or when they're dealing, for that matter, with you know sort of you know UK to US um, or within one jurisdiction or another. Um, I mean, you know, there was um, when we had this uh, debacle over the uh, the Brexit agreement. You can remember the. The, the, the solidarity, the sharp intake of breath uh, that the British government might walk away from a, 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 an agreement they just signed um, uh, and, and, a, and a horror. What we should have done is all made a, a noise together. Um, we, we had some very good advocates um, out there, but we should have, we should have shown uh, more strongly, we could, well, uh, uh, but of course it was also quick, 
uh, uh, our, um, uh, our, 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 our displeasure. <laughs> well, it, Christopher, as, 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 I, as, as you say rightly, I, I, I started this off. Um, I, I, I agree with Robin. I don't think we're... Uh, uh, it's difficult for me to talk about solicitors, obviously. Um, but I don't think the, the bar is not a divided profession as yet. Um, it, 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 um, obviously, I think the, the criminal, the family bar, look at at commercial bar with a great deal of um, uh, what's the word I want uh, longing, I suppose. Um, but I do think that that, for example, the, the 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 funding of pupillages by commercial um, chambers um, it, it certainly shows, as Robin rightly says. Um, it were not yet a divided bar. Perhaps the big firms of solicitors, who, as you say, um, have made massive profits this year, uh, could think about doing more pro bono work in 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 the public funded um, areas rather than just doing the commercial work. That I think would would I mean I for example I do know Alan Novry do a great deal of pro bono stuff. Um, but I mean, perhaps other big firms could think about it as well. But, but as I say, it's quite difficult to think of a solution. Thank you very much. Anyone else would, would like to come in? Let's see. If I could just say, um, yes. in respect of uh, pro bono work, it's interesting. My uh, work is global, and um, uh, there is some interesting advocacy that I think is needed around the world where uh, some bar associations believe that pro bono work is actually a threat to them um, and refuse to support it. Some of them even argue that it's anti competitive. Um, uh, as as uh, as um, work goes, so uh, I think we take a global perspective on this just for a second. There's still a long way to go before even the idea of pro bono is something that's universally accepted, and that has to be advocated for too. Thank you, Ian. Um, I'm mindful of. So, Sir Ian, I think you wanted to say something. So please come in. Uh, could could I come in? Thank you. Um, three or four very quick. Uh, comments. I, I can't talk from personal experience about um, the way the the solicitors part part of the profession, the barristers part of the profession, act together, or, or the solidarity issue that's been raised. But I have always been impressed, I have to say, by the dedication and the selflessness um, of those who do pro bono work, and that certainly comes right across the spectrum. It comes from the big city firms through the the the, the expensive sets of chambers, if you like, and, and right across the whole profession. So I think there is a lot going on and I and, and I'm sure that will that will continue. The second point I'd make briefly is that um, COVID and the experience we've been through for the last two years is is utterly extraordinary. And and there are so many things that will just have to change. You don't, you don't have to pick up a newspaper or look at anything to do with business um, at the moment to realize that that there's going to have to be a complete rethink about how we work, just how we work at the very basic level. I'm sure that will play into the legal profession. I think it just it just has to. Uh, technology was doing that anyway. The forces were moving in that direction, as Robin has said. I think that will that will certainly continue, and I think it will get it will get um, it will get more pronounced. There's a lot we can pick up and learn from that. Thirdly, and connected to that, um, mention has been made of the the governments um, move away from the 0.7% target in the 2015 International Development Act. But that is a temporary move. The government has said that it will it, it aims to go back to that when fiscal circumstances allow. And the, the, there is an issue there clearly about the COVID, the COVID, um, the impact of COVID. What I would simply say though is that I think the merger of the old FCO with the old DFID offers a tremendous opportunity here for a coordinated and coherent, cohesive, powerful government, UK government action in the area of rule of law. Um, we could talk about this for a long time. Robin and I have spent a long time talking about it, but I really think it's potentially very exciting. Um, it won't necessarily require a huge amount of resource. It is one of these things which requires, I think, a slight refocusing of, of the dial, and a, but I think the opportunities are, are definitely there. So looking at the overseas aspect of things for sure. On the UK internal market bill, um, I 
will be very careful here, but I simply observe the reaction there was in the newspapers, in the media, in Parliament, to what the government said. Um, I think in, in, in my experience of, of the work I've had in this role in government for a long time, coming to an end, no doubt, but I think that the importance of international law, the importance of rule of law has never been greater, never been more public, never been higher profile. That would be my take on it. That may be a surprise to you, but that's certainly where I see it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Ian. Now, I'm, I'm terribly mindful of, we are part of a, a webathon, which is a word I didn't know, didn't even know existed before I was invited to moderate this event. <laughs> And so there's another event coming right up in, in about 10 minutes. Um, I hope, I hope, so I'd like to bring it to a close now. So to give people a chance to perhaps, people who do want to continue on with the next sessions um, to take a small break. Um, from the bottom of my heart, I wanna thank all of you for taking the time to be with us this afternoon and for sharing your wisdom on this question of the rule of law. And, and I hope that to the people who are listening and who were asking themselves the question, well, what can I do in this world that as uh, Judge Corner has described is, is, is very bleak right now. What, what is my role? I hope that you found some inspiration here from, from what people have said, because as I said in the beginning, all of you who are on this panel have contributed in one way or another, certainly beyond just doing your job at promoting the rule of law. And there's much that we can all do. So thank you again for being with us. Thank you to the Law Society of England and Wales for organizing this colloquium. Thank you to the organizers of, of the webathon. Uh, I think the ABA and some of the other organizations. I'd like to leave you with a quote um, from Martin Luther King, who said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And so if you think of it that way, then perhaps we all have a role to play to bend it a little bit towards that better place that we as human beings strive and aspire to. The work does not stop here. There's much to do, whether we do it through pro bono, whether we do it through lobbying government, whether we do it through helping wherever we can. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining us. And I think I'm supposed to now encourage everyone to move on to the next session, which comes to you or will come to you in a few minutes from Barcelona in Spain um, to join the Barcelona Bar Association for a panel discussing gender equality and the rule of law, two sides of the same coin. So that is in exactly seven minutes. So please, please stay tuned for that. Thank you everybody again.